Hey everybody, Mr. Lake here. Today we are talking about ionic bonds. What are they? Why do they form? And how do they form? Let's get into it. Something you already know is that atoms have electrons, and those electrons exist in orbitals, and those orbitals form levels. And the most important level is the valence shell. And that valence shell wants to have eight electrons in it. And an atom is going to do whatever it needs to do in order to achieve that desire, which we call the octet rule. And of course, atoms don't actually have desires or anything. I'm, I'm giving them emotions they don't have, but that's kind of how I talk about it. So some atoms want to gain electrons. Some atoms want to give electrons away. But where do those electrons go? And where do those electrons come from? Where do they come from? Where do they go? Electron Joe? They go to other atoms, and they come from other atoms. There's not just like a pool of electrons just floating in the atmosphere that if an atom wants to give away an electron, it just kind of kicks it out into the cloud of electrons. And, and you know, if an atom wants to gain an electron, it just grabs one from the air. That's not how it works. Electrons exist in atoms. I mean, of course, electrons can exist as beta particles or separately, but it's not the general rule. Electrons exist in atoms. So if an atom wants to gain an electron, it's got to get it from another atom. If an atom wants to lose an electron, it has to give it to another atom. And generally, what that means is that atoms that want to give electrons and atoms that want to gain electrons find each other and they exchange electrons, and we call them bonding partners. And there's an exchange, kind of like there's been an exchange in this photograph. Photograph, I sound old. In this JPEG image. Um, just a quick aside, someone a few years ago did a realistic kind of computer animation rendering of what SpongeBob and Patrick would look like in real life. And I'm going to show it to you right now, not because it has anything to do with chemistry, because I find it interesting, as someone who used to watch SpongeBob, who would happily still watch SpongeBob if given the chance. But I do want to warn you that it is a little bit disturbing. So if you don't feel up for this, maybe just close your eyes for the next couple of seconds. Here you go. There they are. SpongeBob and Patrick. Best friends forever. Ugh. All right. Let's talk about something a little bit cuter. Cats. Why are we talking about cats all of a sudden? Well, it's because we have special names for positive and negative ions. Of course, chemists could just call them positive and negative ions, but why would we do that when we can make it more complicated? So the term that is often used to refer to positive ions is cations. And it's said like that. It's not cations or cations, cations. And so you can remember cations are positive ions. Meow. Pause. Get it? Or you can remember that the plus, the T in the middle of cations looks like a plus sign. And metals are the elements that are going to form these positive ions, these cations. The word that we use for negative ions is anions, not anions even though it kind of looks like onions, it's pronounced anion. As in, I've got anion you. And it's the nonmetals that are going to form these negatively charged anions. Oh, I'm in the way. So things want to give away or gain electrons, and they're gonna find each other to do that. And when a metal gives electrons to a nonmetal, that helps them to both satisfy the octet rule, right? Something that wants to give an electron, that something that wants to gain an electron, find each other. And if they do that, then they will achieve the octet rule, or at least be closer to achieving the octet rule. In these situations, there is a, a real full electron exchange. One electron moves from one atom to another atom. Now, not everything is a kind of one-to-one -one pairing. 
sometimes there will be multiple atoms involved. There could be multiple cations or multiple anions or multiples of both. So for example, um, an example of a one-to-one -one relationship would be, let's say an oxygen that wants to gain two electrons finds a calcium that wants to lose two electrons. Well, that calcium will just give its two electrons to the oxygen. They're both happy and they both achieve the octet rule. But what if the oxygen finds hydrogen instead? Well, hydrogens want to give one electron. And so an oxygen that wants to gain two electrons can find two hydrogen atoms, each of which give it one of those electrons. And so now you've got a combination of one oxygen and two hydrogens. All of them are achieving the octet rule by that kind of like three member situation. So ionic bonds are not just between two atoms. Sometimes they can be between many atoms that have a complex way of all achieving the octet rule. And then there's kind of this unintended consequence, which is, well, maybe intended, which is the actual bonding that happens. So when something gives electrons to something else, it means that now charges have formed. The thing that gave away electrons is now a positively charged atom. The thing that gained the electrons is now a negatively charged atom, a, a cation and an anion. And what happens when two things that are close together have negative charges, they attract one another. And so they get stuck. So things will, atoms will find each other in order to exchange electrons and achieve the octet rule. And then the consequence is that when they do that, they get stuck together because they now have opposite charges that attract one another. This is called ionic bonding or an ionic bond, a bond formed due to attraction of oppositely charged ions. Now, it's really important to recognize that ionic bonds, which is what we're going to focus on for the next several days, maybe even a full week, we're going to focus on ionic bonds and get into ionic bond naming and formulas and all that good stuff. But I do want to recognize that it's not the only type of bond. So don't get in your head that like this is how things bond together is by exchanging electrons. There are other ways. So for example, nonmetals can bond to one another by sharing electrons in a covalent bond because they all want to gain electrons. And so they can share their electrons in order to kind of give each other access to electrons and still satisfy the octet rule without actually anyone losing or gaining electrons. Very clever. Metals can also bond together. Like you can have a bar of iron. Maybe you've seen a bar of iron before. Those atoms are bonded together even though they all want to give away electrons. And the way that they do that is they kind of have a mutual sharing of the load of those extra electrons. The metal atoms kind of all come together and they form this external electron cloud that will hold their extra electrons for them and kind of disperse that amongst all of the uh, um, metals that are there. If that didn't make any sense, that's fine. I just want to point out that there are different kinds of bonds beyond ionic bonds, and that's important to know. And that's it for this video. Until next time, take care, everybody.